Launchpad has now been around for three seasons and coaches everywhere are saving time and being more efficient when it comes to scout cards. Coach Robinson from Texas says, the thing I most enjoy is the ease of access to all the scout cards and how I can draw on them if I need to make any changes. Every coach that uses it says that it is so great to use. If you and your staff are tired of the old ways of preparing and using scout cards, check out thecoachpad.com to start enjoying scout team and making the 2023 season better than ever. Um, welcome back to Nerves so of the Gap Down Packer podcast. Um, today we have Coach Joe Jardina. He is the head football coach at Long Island City High School in New York. Coach, how are you doing? Doing all right. Thank you for having me. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, before we get started, everybody, make sure you like, share, subscribe, all that lovely jazz. We're getting uh, close, if not by the time this post, to 5,000 YouTube subscribers. Um, but, Coach, I mean, how did you end up as the head football coach at uh, Long Island? All right. So, um, you know, I actually come from a lacrosse background. I played college lacrosse. I, uh, you know, got drafted, played for, a, you know, got drafted to play in the major league lacrosse league. Um, but, you know, I went to school to be a teacher. I played high school football and I just have always loved football uh, ever since I could remember, you know, even from the PB days when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. Um, you know, when I was applying for teaching jobs, the school, Long Island City High School and Astoria, Queens. They told me that they were looking for a head football coach, a head lacrosse coach, and a phys ed teacher. So uh sent my application in, and uh, things worked out. Well, I, mean, I, I was going to ask you about that at some point before we got into the, the football aspect is is you are, you are now the second coach I know that also coaches lacrosse. A uh, buddy of mine helped start the uh, lacrosse program over at Xenia High School by us. Um, so he's their O-line coach and head lacrosse coach. Um, I mean, I mean, what drew you to the cross? The cross is more of a northeastern thing. It's it's slowly becoming a bigger thing here in Ohio. Um, but what kind of drew you to the cross? Uh, so you know, my my real true love is actually ice hockey. Uh, I was on skates when I was four years old. I started playing football lacrosse when I was five years old, and um, you know, I I just always stayed active. Um, and then I guess. You know, when it got to the point between travel hockey, travel lacrosse, my dad said, pick one. So I chose travel lacrosse. Uh, you know, lacrosse is in the spring. Football is in the fall. Uh, so I was able to I was able to manage both. And then, you know, by the time I got into high school, I started getting recruited. And I wound up attending the Delphi University on a lacrosse scholarship, got my degree in physical education. I had the time of my life there, you know, won a couple of conference championships. Didn't get the national championship, but, uh, you know, millions of friends and millions of memories that I'm going to take to the grave for sure. Good, good. And then, and then I, as we kind of spoke, you were also a volunteer firefighter, which is a commendable thing. I just want to commend you on that. I have some friends that thank and you, thank family you. friends, but I just want to commend you on that because it, it's always good when people help their communities. Um, yeah, quick shout out, Engine 695, Wantha Fire Department. Thank so I, I, we do appreciate that. Um, but I mean, go, going into the fo the football aspect is, um, I put out a thing of just trying to learn a little bit more about the wishbone. I was reading Emory Ballard's book, um, which really wasn't like fully. I mean, he is considered the father of the wishbone. Um, helped uh, originated at Texas and did some stuff at the high school beforehand. And um, the book doesn't get into too much detail about the actual wishbone, but kind of where it came from and why. Um, why have you added the wishbone as a package for your offense? Like, obviously, you're a bit, you do run some T stuff and wing T stuff as well. Uh, so, you know, traditionally, most of our base set is our is a wing T. Um, and I just I felt like I don't know if it was a tendency of mine or anything like that, but I just felt that some team started adding an extra guy and almost kind of figuring out where I was going. And I didn't really like that. So what I decided to do is I just tried to balance it out and I brought my uh, my wide receiver in as a double tight end and I brought my my uh, wing back into the backfield and I said, all right, guys, we're going to go into a wishbone now. So now it kept it super balanced. You can run everything from both sides, left, right. Um, un unlike a traditional wing tee and calling it by the number, you know, each, each blocking scheme is a number. I do it based off of color, um, all the same stuff. So, you know, you could run – 
our buck series, which is our green color. So we'll call them the huddle green 26. We'll run our buck series to the right and nothing else changes for the offensive line. The only thing that changes is the alignment for the skill guys. Yeah. Um, I just think that the offensive line is, is without a doubt the hardest position on the field and the less confusing and the less movement we have to do for those guys, the better off it is. So figured with the skill guys, you know, they could get all the glory, but definitely give the offensive line a little bit of an easier transition by keeping the guys in the box and making the blocks easier and more accessible for them. Okay. Now, now with, with adding that and, and has that altered what you're running at all out of your base wing T and out of like, did it change? Cause obviously you have your series is your buck series, your belly series and and so forth. And we did that change anything like, okay, we're, we've added this package. We've added the power T package to keep ourselves balanced and take away tendencies. Is there anything that no, altered- not, nothing, no, no, nothing really changed. The only thing that I, that I noticed, um, you know, when I'm when I'm looking at a defense, the only thing that I noticed is that it kind of just brought in the defense a little bit more. Um, I don't know if the wishbone may is super intimidating where they kind of stuff the inside of the box a little bit more, but I did notice that, you know, we were able to get to the outside a little bit easier out of the wishbone. I don't know if it was I don't know why. Um, but I guess the corners maybe are in a little bit tighter towards the tight end. Um, the linebackers, I guess they I don't know. I don't know if they get washed inside and they kind of panic, but most of our stuff out of the wishbone, we could, we really could do out of any series. I always joke around with uh, my team. I say, guys, we really only run like eight plays. We just have, you know, a hundred formations. And, you know, at first they're like, what are you talking about? And then I, you know, like throw the, I throw our halfback out in the, you know, out wide on the left side next to the wide receiver. And we still can run the same inside trap. And they're like, Oh wait, yeah, that is the same play. I'm like, yeah, other teams aren't gonna know that. They're gonna look for tendency out there. You know, we run, you know, like when we do our preseason, um, when we do our preseason scrimmages, I'll run, you know, we do 15 plays, 15 plays, whoever we're going against, and I'll run all 15 plays from the exact same formation. And you know, the coaches is like, I have no idea what you're running. I said that's that's the whole point. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, now with hitting it out, I mean, obviously they are bringing more in with these sets, the wishbone set. How much have have you played at all with, obviously the base wishbone set is double tights, three backs. Have you mm-hmm. played with splitting out receivers and taking away tight ends? Have you tested any Emory Ballard, one tight end and one split out flanker? How much or is it you just kept it true, double tight, three back? Uh, so we we do keep it double tight, but we do we do spread it out. We do have a, a call called over, um, and our over call is the wide receiver goes out on the right hand side, the tight end is on the right hand side, and the tight end is covered. So we kind of just throw an extra guy out there, almost like a little unbalanced. Uh, we do the same thing, no real uh, reinventing the wheel with the name, but we call it left over. So it's on the left side. Okay. No, and then and the right side. Um, and, and then, you know, we try to go on down or first sound and try to catch the defense sleeping a little bit. Okay. And then now, like, when we first started going back and forth, obviously you run buck out of it. You run trap, belly, and iso, which are kind of standard um, wing T plays. If I remember correctly, I um, you also mentioned you run the triple a little bit out of it as well. Um, yes, sir. I'll start with this. Let's – let's. I mean – when you're running buck sweep out of it, let's start there. What are there any, uh, obviously O-line wise, nothing changes backfield wise. What changes or alters for you guys, or is, is there any real alter besides it's probably getting handed off a little bit deeper? Um, You know, the only thing that's a little bit different, I would say is we have the, you know, we have our lead back. So for example, we're in the wishbone our right back our right back is the one who is going to lead block and go up the field first so we're still going to have our play side guard hit our back side guard is going to wrap and our running back our first running back is going to lead block through as an extra guy if anybody slips through the cracks and then the guy with the ball is going to follow so we really have three guys lead blocking okay so it almost becomes like a super buck at that point because you have an extra exactly what it is okay yeah. And then if I'm feeling crazy and 
they don't have anybody in the in a one technique on the uh, the backside. We'll even let our fullback go. We'll just have four guys leave blocking. Okay, and I've seen I've seen a little bit of that four. I have I know a guy in oh god, I always mix them up. Indiana, or Illinois. I want to say it's Illinois. Um, that run his alteration to their buck instead of pulling the front side guard, he pulls the full. He sends the fullback out as a lead, just mm-hmm. to help as an alter. He calls it F buck. It's just an alteration, just from a tendency standpoint, and it eliminate front side penetration. Um, why? I mean, triple is not typically a typical wing T play. Um, it's typically considered more in that flex bone hemisphere. Let's just let's just be honest. Um, so why mm-hmm. is uh, Veer part of your package? So uh, before I got the job at Long Island City High School. I was coaching at East Meadow High School and East Meadow High School is another school out here on Long Island and they are well known for the flex bone triple option. And I, I, I've spoken to kids who played against East Meadow. I never played against East Meadow in high school and everybody always said to me, Oh, you got to still run that annoying offense. Like, yeah, it's so hard to read. And I just always kept that in the back of my head. So I said, you know, if I, if I'm going to be hammering a dive with my fullback, if I do fullback dive, fullback dive, fullback dive, now everybody crashes. I might as well just keep it and keep going and make a triple option out of it. Yeah. I mean, and from a play calling perspective, how much is it part? I mean, obviously, Buck's probably one of your heavier run plays as a wing T guy. Um, how much is your veer part of your mm-hmm. packages? Uh, so early on in the season, it we didn't run it a lot at all. Um, I had a sophomore quarterback, uh, this kid, Tim Hernandez. It was his first year ever playing football and first year ever playing quarterback. So, uh, you know, he was a point guard on the basketball team as a ninth grader, really good athlete, really awesome kid, honor student. And, and, you know, beginning of the year, he struggled a little bit. But, you know, he and I would go during his lunch period, during his off periods, and um, we'd just talk about it. We'd watch, you know, Army-Navy clips. I'd pull up a video from East Meadow High School where I used to coach. And, you know, I'd just pause it and say, hey, what's the read here? And he wound up doing a really good job with it. Um, you know, I think he he might have had, you know, two or three touchdowns on it this year. Uh, but it's just something that we added because I felt like just to keep confusing the defense. I feel like that's the biggest part of offense. Okay. Um, so that's why every everything we do, I tell him, I said, continue out your fake. Hold that guy on the backside you know, carry out, maybe that safety is going to follow you and just keep the lane open inside, you know, so uh, he, he does a really good job of that. Good. Now, I mean, with – when when you evaluate your packages every year, because obviously you run the wing T as your base, you run – I mean, wing T is known for formationing people to death and running their series, your power T series, your wishbone series. When you evaluate all that after the year, what – determinations do you make in terms of formations going forward what to add what to subtract obviously some of that's personnel based going into the next year but when you're looking at this stuff how do you evaluate it and how do you look to build on or, or subtract on it each year um you know that that's a good question i i feel like like you just said it really depends on the personnel um you know last year i had a i had a a pretty decent offensive line. I'm sorry, not not this past season, but a season ago, I had a pretty decent offensive line, but I had a running back who he was able to just make guys miss. So, you know, between us, I didn't really work with my offensive line as much as I would have liked to. Um, but this year, I felt like we had a brand new offensive line, a brand new team. Our first game, we had nine guys playing their very first football game. So we had, uh, we had a lot of really new stuff to implement. So uh, we got our base wing T stuff down. Um, a lot of down blocking and pulling. And then, you know, this year, this next year, my whole offensive line returns, my quarterback, my fullback, my wide receiver, my my wing back, everybody's returning for me. So we're going to try to build upon it a little bit just by uh, just by really perfecting it. Because I think, you know, there's a reason why the wing T has been around since, you know, before I was even born. And there's a reason why it's so successful. So, I mean, so with that, obviously with having a massive turnover in your roster, how I, I'm curious about this anytime somebody goes through that, especially as somebody who's currently coaching at a small school, 
what does that do what does that do to your practice and what your practice looks like at the beginning of the year when you have that many new faces uh so you know uh, i'd be lying to you if i said that there weren't challenges um you know so i don't know how much you or any of the listeners really know about new york city football but it's really not super big you have the powerhouses like the erasmus halls who was on cbs sports last night you have you know that whole conference and that's really you know quote unquote the a-listers everybody else is uh you know my my whole team a lot of guys don't play football until they get to high school so for me there's a lot of teaching rather than coaching and why i like that challenge is i'm able to teach them the way that i like things being done so if i'm teaching a guard just to get into a stance you know i could correct him and say hey you know, make sure your right arm is down instead of your left arm or whatever it is. And, you know, that kid doesn't know anything different. So that's the only way he's going to learn. So I feel like it has its advantages in that regard. But the disadvantages are I have to teach them everything, like how to get into a three-point stance. So, you know, we, we do a lot of video, a lot of football drills. Um, social media is is so big. I keep, you know, I have group chats on Instagram with all the guys. You know, I have my lineman group my linebacker group, my skills group. And anytime I see or anybody else sees a video on Instagram, we just forward it to each other and just put it in the group chat. And, you know, hopefully the guys are watching, learning and soaking up anything that they can really soak up. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously you said you have a massive retention for next year, um, obviously with not really losing too much this year and you guys having a fairly successful year, um, been hosting your first home playoff game. How's that? How do you plan on building on that? Or how, what alterations are you looking at making practice wise and development wise? Obviously, with having so many guys come back, you're a little more ahead of the curve than you normally are. Um, how is that looking for next year in terms of, okay, we're, we have our fundamental base. Here's my plans going forward. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, when we began, you know, I was a multi-sport athlete growing up. Um, so my assistant coach, by the way, in New York City, we only have two coaches on staff, which is another uh, challenge itself. But um, my assistant coach and I, you know, we we are full promoters in having these kids, you know, play multiple sports. So it's a little easier for me because I am the lacrosse coach as well. So a lot of the guys play lacrosse, but we encourage the guys to compete in swimming and wrestling and basketball and all these other sports. So once the winter sports rolls around and they kind of get out of there, you know, we, we give them a little bit of rest and then we try to do some morning workouts, you know, lacrosse stuff, you know, it, it, so, you know, it, it's really hard to explain because if you don't know New York city, a lot of people don't can't wrap their head around it. But, um, you know, my football field in the spring, we use lacrosse on it and, you know, where you have the outfield and the baseball field and the softball field. So, you know, during the spring season, we really have football. I'm sorry, we have boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse, baseball, and softball all going on on one field. So for the first two weeks, all four of us are on the field, and we're, you know, we're, we're arguing with, you know, all of us from sharing office, but we're all arguing with each other about, you know, who who's going to get what space. And, you know, once games roll around, there's really no room for extra practice. So the guys who do do football stuff with me, they uh, the guys who do play lacrosse with me, we do do a little football-related you know, workouts, um, this football is much bigger in New York city than it is, uh, than lacrosse is. So that's how we kind of start building and getting ready for next year. Okay. And, and I mean, kind of go, swinging back to the wishbone stuff is, I mean, what, what do you normally see when, uh, obviously you kind of mentioned that people condense really heavily inside, um, Front wise, what are you typically seeing? What adjustments are people trying to do? Um, how, what is that? Is it much different? Do they make, obviously, you said in a wing T, is there a big adjustment from, okay, when you're wing T to the wishbone, do they make major adjustments or is it just kind of they're just going to play with what they came in with? Uh, you know, most of the, uh, most of the teams we played this year. So we played, we had nine games and I think out of the nine games we played, 
I would say I would say six of them were even fronts. So a lot of it was either a four two five or a four four, which I really consider the same thing because all of our blocking rules are the same. But um, you know, for the most part, we see even fronts, and then we do make a little adjustments based off an odd front. We uh, uh one team was a, th- a thirty three stack, the other team was a five two. And the other team was actually a 7-4. They just blitzed everybody. And that was the that was really hard to um that, boy, that was the hardest to really uh plan for because everybody's rushing. And if one guy misses a block, they're tackling you in the backfield. You know, it was pretty uh the four guys they played man coverage on the backs and the, the, it was you had to sneak someone out. And they did a really good job of disguising it and but otherwise mostly an even front. Okay. And did that did that alter how much you were in your wishbone, your T or your wing T based off what they were giving you? Um obviously the seven four is a little bit different monster of it's it's bit it's either it's, it's that high reward, high risk defense there. Um but from you've seen so much even front because like we see yeah. a lot odd front here right now. How much did that adjust or did it make it easier seeing so much even? Um, I think it made it a little easier even. Um, like like I said earlier, our our rules don't really change whether it's an odd or even front. It was really just a matter of knowing which guy to block, which obviously is the whole point of the offensive line. Um, but with guys who don't really, you know, I'm explaining to these guys what three technique is, you know, two days before our first game. So it's, to me, it's just, hey, the first guy to your left. Like, you know, we really got to dumb it down as much as possible. First guy to your left, first guy to your right. Um, and, you know, we the one adjustment we make is based off the guy who's over the wing. If the guy who's over the wing back is outside, we usually leave him free and let that guy get kicked. Or, or if the guy's inside, we'll have our wing back kind of continue to down block him and have the – the guard who's pulling just really lead block and hopefully a running back doesn't run in front of him. Yeah. Now you mentioned the obvious success in at addings of uh, makes you a lot more balanced, um, harder to kind of dictate when you're in your T or wishbone stuff. Okay. What their tendency it naturally is instead of a regular, like red or blue set or various other things. Mm-hmm. Um, but what hurdles and adding it, did you have or minor or little details that you had to clean up or look at when you added it um, compared to your regular wing T stuff? Um, you know, the the hardest part, I think, and I really don't know why, um, but it was just really the spacing of where the, the running back should be. Um, and also in our wing T, we we keep our fullback at five yards, um, a little bit further back than normal. But when we go to our T or our wishbone, our fullback's at four, and that that was really the only adjustment that we made. Um, but the uh, the running backs itself, I think, just really hammering their steps, making sure that you know they're taking that counter step if they need to, or the hesitation step, or um, you know, running three steps parallel to the right and then cutting it upfield instead of trying to, you know, bubble or banana out. I think that was really really the hardest challenge uh, we had as a staff trying to figure out, but um, no real adjustments, really. Yeah, and that's similar to what, like, I was reading, there's a a spot in Emory Ballard's book about how don't ever have their initial steps forward. He's talking to Alabama staff, kind of like you just mentioned, because it met, creates a soft arch, which isn't ideal for anything you're doing, uh, to always have counter steps or um, lateral steps or jab steps instead of vertical. Um, that's kind of one of the things that I picked up on, and that's interesting that you mentioned that was kind of one of your challenges as well and things that you kind of picked up on and um, messed with. Um, I, I curiosity, what have you had most success with running out of your wishbone stuff? Uh, what has kind of been your like one or two go-to plays that seem to be, um, the most success there? Um, our buck sweep, our inside trap and our triple option. Okay. 
It, it would it be in that order or those would... three, uh, those three have hit pretty much. Um, no, I, I don't know. It, it really depended on the opponent. Like, um, our week eight game against Tilden, uh, we ran triple option almost every play and we got positive yards. I'm pretty sure every play except two. Um, yeah. But then when we played our playoff game against August Martin, the team that rushed seven guys at a time, we ran triple option maybe two times and it was successful once and not successful the other time. So, um, you know, it really did depend on the, uh, on the team and I just, how our quarterback read it. Um, the buck sweep, I think definitely worked. I had, um, I had a really good, nice, nice running back, uh, this kid Carter, um, first year playing football, didn't really start getting touches until week, week four or five, because he was having a really tough time with his confidence. Um, and Carter, in the last four games, he might have had maybe 50 touches and rushed for almost 500 yards. So he he figured it out fast. Um, another awesome kid. He honors student, and you know I try to make it as easy as possible. Like hey, run to the right, and you know it's always the smart kids that really have a hard time figuring out which way to run because they're almost like overanalyzing the play. But uh, by the time Carter was able to pick it up, he was he ran hard, he ran fast, and you know he was uh, he put his shoulder down or he'd make you miss. So. He's going to have a really good senior year. I'm looking forward to watching him grow. All right. And the last question for you is, is when, you, when you, at what point during your install process do you add the wishbone? Because obviously that's not your base package. It's not your day one stuff. Um, Buck probably is. And then obviously your base sets and kind of building off it. At what point in your camp install do you say, hey, okay, this is where we're going to put this in. We, I feel comfortable that we're good enough at buck or trap or anything to where now we can add this balance. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I think you know, I think uh, I'm going to revert back to what you said again, where it kind of really depends on the personnel. Um, but last year, I'm pretty sure we installed it like the first week. Because we had all of our stuff. This is, you know, this is my third year at the school, our second year, our second year running this offense. Um, so a lot of our guys knew it. Um, and they were pretty comfortable with it. But I I'm pretty sure we ran, we were running wishbone in in training camp. So I don't think it took really too long. There was really no uh crazy adjustments that we had to make with it aside just the alignment and just getting our steps down. But we continued practicing that throughout the entire season. So okay. All right, perfect, Coach. Uh, coaches, um, A, make sure you give Coach a follow on Twitter. Um, it will be in the bio. Um, I don't think it's too complicated. Uh, if I remember correct, uh, it's at Coach G underscore L-I-C. Um, so give Coach a coach follow. Coach G L-I-C. Um, he, he'll talk to you about – I mean, he's got a bunch of stuff he's running. So, obviously, wing T, power T, wishbone. Like I said, I wanted to pick his brain a little bit about why he runs it – I mean, any complications, so forth, I think kind of hit on that. And um, other than that, like, share, subscribe, all that lovely jazz. Check out our sponsor, Coach Pad. Um, and like I said, if you've not subscribed, subscribe because we're close to 5,000. Um, otherwise, that is another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Thank you, Coach. Thank you so much for having me. appreciate it.